record. So the recording stopped. Uh, let's just continue. So our, our abstract is synthesis of um, trioxalatochromate trihydrate. Do you want to type this over again? Maybe not. No. I just accidentally left that out. Put that in here. What did we synthesize it from? Okay, um, from potassium dichromate. What else? Oxalic acid. That was the oxalic acid monohydrate. What else? Potassium oxalate. So synthesis of potassium trioxalatochromate 3 trihydrate K3 CROX3.3 H2O solid from potassium dichromate oxalic acid monohydrate and uh, potassium oxalate. I think that was it, right? And potassium oxalate. Maybe, well, maybe I should put in the ethanol in there as well, but. Add the ethanol later. Using um, what are the reactions? Using redox, then Lewis acid base, and um, metathesis reactions. Metathesis precipitation of a solid product was accomplished by a solvent exchange. Uh, we can add a little bit more detail here. This is a two sentence abstract. We can add more detail or we can make the reader read the paper. And so if the reader says, okay, this looks like something they would like to investigate further, then they're gonna to have to get the, the whole paper. Um, or we could add more words here. So maybe we'll talk about the redox reaction you know, here. We could say oxalic acid was used to reduce chromium-6. Now, um, to chromium-3. Uh, 
and maybe what we'll do is I'll add on to this. And the oxalic acid was oxidized to carbon dioxide. Chromium three plus were um, subsequently chelated. Bidentate ligand oxalate oxalato The product was, and I'll at the end, to say the product was isolated via vacuum filtration washed and Isolated by a vacuum filtration and washed. Now this is a rough draft, so we're going to change this. I wouldn't really say this on a real paper. Um, what did the crystals look like initially? What would you say the color of the crystals were? Black. Black. How big were the crystals, would you say, around? A millimeter? Less than a half a millimeter? Now, we're in the process still, but we want to just get a head start on the paper. And so we had one final step to this. What was the final step? Recrystallization. So we should say something about the recrystallization of these. The crystals were then redissolved in water in order to recrystallize.
by Solomon Exchange. So we need to um, talk about the final with the final. So we'll add one more sentence to this, but it's starting to get a little long. But does this tell us pretty much what's happening or what we did in the paper in the, in the, um, in the lab? So we'll leave it at this. So this is our initial draft of the abstract. Move on to the next section. Okay, the next section is introduction, and so that's standard. Uh, most papers will, after the abstract will have the int introduction. So the introduction, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my original margins. So I did that down here. I'm back to my original margins and original font. And in the abstract, I probably can pinch this in further. Maybe I'll pinch it into one, one inch. We don't have to put the word introduction. Normally the first um, section is the introduction section, but I'm going to just type in introduction here. And so this will be the next part of the paper. Um, let's see what they say about the introduction section. A good introduction is a clear statement of the problem or project and why you are studying it. This information should be contained in the first few sentences. On the basis of your answer to the question of what the readers already know, give a concise background of the problem and the significance, scope, and limits of your work. Outline what has been done before by citing truly pertinent literature, but do not include a general survey of semi-relevant literature. State how your work differs from work previously published or state how it is related. Demonstrate the continuity from the previous work to yours. Your introduction should be at least one or two paragraphs long. Ordinarily, the heading introduction is not used because it is super close. Opening paragraphs are usually introductory in nature. So basically, um, you know, I was talking about the review paper. The review paper gives you a review of, you know, all the key players in the field and what they've done when they did it. And so your introduction is kind of like where your paper fits in, you know, in, in the field. Maybe there was some question or maybe there were some issues that needed to be resolved and your paper would set out to resolve those questions or answer those questions and resolve those issues. And so ours is, well, we just had this um, experiment that we had to do, but what we're going to try to do is we're just going to do a little bit of um, background. So the way we're going to look at the introduction is maybe we have some history or maybe we have some relevance, you know, history of the compound or maybe some um, relevance that is what is this compound used for? And so what we need to do is we need, you know, and if we had a review paper, if we had a review paper, like everything you needed to know about potassium trioxalate of chromate 3, then that would be perfect because then we'd know what everybody did. But what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to figure out our own. Now, writing a review paper is a lot of work and we have to have access to scientific databases. And so what are we going to do? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to do the best we can with literature search and see what, you know, what information we can find out. You know, why would anybody want to synthesize this stuff? You know, what is this stuff used for? And um, we'll try to include that in the paper because what we're trying to do is make this stuff. And so why would anybody try to make it? And, and then, you know, are the, obviously there are different ways of making things. So, you know, why did we start with the chemicals we started with? Like, for example, in the first step, we started with dichromate and um, to make chromium-3, but why didn't we just buy chromium-3? 
you know, chromium three is easily um, purchasable. And so, well, we did it just to learn some more chemistry and do more chemistry, but you know, those types of stuff we might include something like the introduction. So, what we're going to do is um, this. Uh, we want to learn a little bit more about this compound and a little bit more about the history of this compound. And so we want to do some searches, like for example, um, we, we could do a Google Scholar search, or we could just do a standard search. So let's go to Google Scholar. And then we're going to type in um, the potassium, oh, I guess I can. I'm going to type in this whole thing. See if any stuff comes up. I might try the anti just one too. So we have some stuff the crystal structure of uh, tris oxalate chromium. Now they did something that we don't do. Like here, they used a hyphen here. We don't use a hyphen here. We keep everything all together. These are the trihydrates, so let's go. This was published in 1978. Unfortunately, all we have access to is the abstract. We don't have access to the whole paper. Um, and in order to get the whole paper, it's going to cost us $35. And so it's probably not worth it. And so we see, maybe it's worth it. You read the abstract and you go, wow, I need the other information. Then it might be worth purchasing. All right, so we know what the crystal structure is. They tell us, you know, the crystal structure and some of the other, this is all crystallography data here. From Australian Journal of Chemistry. This detail. So you can see the title, the byline, the affiliation. There's no affiliation here, which is strange. So we're going to look for our research for information about the abstract. We can do that today. But, um, but we want a little bit, maybe some historical context or some practical use. You know, why would anybody want this stuff? And so try to find something about it. <laughs> then we're going to go to experimental details. This is called experimental details. If it's a theory, theoretical paper, then it's the theoretical basis. You know, theoreticians don't do experimental work in the lab. You know, they do work on the computer. And so they're, they'd be talking about the computational basis. You know, what are the equations? Where do the equations come from for their thing? We did all lab work. So our, ours is going to be experimental details. It's also called experimental methods, experimental section, or materials and methods. It depends on the publication. So it says check the specific publication for which one of these to use. So um, what we're trying to call is we have the introduction section, which we're going to write later after doing some research. And then we're going to have the experimental section. The experimental section we can write right now. And the experimental section is often the easiest section, well, um, out of the main section, so it might be the easiest one to write. And so let's take a look at what they say in the experimental section. For, pub for experimental work, give enough detail about your materials and methods so that other experienced workers can repeat your work and obtain comparable results. So the level of detail is you want others to be able to repeat it exactly the same way you did it. That is, the same quantities, the same reagents, and ideally they should get the same results, the colors, the changes, everything else. 
when using a standard method reference, so sometimes you don't have to, if it's standard, like you weighed something on the balance, you don't have to describe that in the paper. You know, it's standard. You did a vacuum filtration, and that's pretty standard. Although you also have to think about your audience. You know, your audience might not have used a Buchner funnel, so you might include the figure of the Buchner funnel depending on the audience. The target audience is somebody with comparable uh, academic background as you. As you so, um, in a in a professional report, you would never show the vacuum apparatus setup, you know, the vacuum filtration apparatus setup. But in this paper, we can go ahead and add to it because our audience is a little different. Identify the materials that you used and give information on the degree and criteria for purity. Everybody wants to know, you know, so you bought this stuff, but how good is this stuff? You know, how pure is it? And so when we um, buy chemicals, like say, for example, we started off with potassium dichromate. Well, you know, we bought that from, I don't know, Aldridge or somebody, but how good is that? And so we need to know this. So uh, let's go to a different. Let's go to a chemical company. Um, one of the big ones, Sigma Aldrich, is a huge company. And when you go here, um, we can type in. Uh, let's see. Do not. So. Um, let's put in some potassium chromate uh, or dichromate as an example here. So. Uh, potassium dichromate, we have different ones in oxidation reagents. So, take a look. In physical and chemical property standards, let's just go with the first one here. Potassium dichromate. And we have different levels. So, for example, if you look at product number 102403, this is what we call a uh, primary standard. This is traceable to NIST, and, um, and NIST is the National Institute of Standards. And so this is going to be um, a highly characterized and very expensive. So you look at this, 80 grams for $110. Eighty grams for $110 compared to, let's look at other grades of this. So if we look at um, some other grades, this is called ACS reagent, right? And we can get 500 grams for $171. But if we look at the purity, the purity is 99.0 or greater. And so we can buy different levels of purity. So, for example, if we want this as reference material for um, titrations, this is for redox titrations, is often used. This is 99.5%. And so, if we buy 50 grams of this, 50 grams of this is $267 because it has a greater purity. Yeah. And so, when people want to know, they want to know what did you start off with? Did you start off with garbage? Or did you start off with the really expensive stuff? Our stuff is the low grade stuff, you know, um, which we call technical grade. And so what you need to know is you need to know the grades um, for chemical reagents. So below is a list of chemical grades in order of purity from highest to lowest. So we get technical grade. Why? Um, we get technical grade because it's the, the cheapest. But it's also the least pure. Um, in order to go from technical, this is like technical grade is after synthesis. Maybe you wash it, you collect the crystals, but you certainly don't recrystallize it because that's too expensive and you're wasting chemical. 
Um, and then we have USP gray, reagent gray, and ACS gray. Yeah, ACS and reagent gray are probably the two most pure. Purity is generally equal to ACS gray. ACS is supposed to be the highest quality now. Highest quality means the highest purity. So let's look at technical gray. We'll go to Carolina. Carolina Bi Biological Supply is another one. Yeah. And so we'll take a look at technical grade. That coming. Usually when you buy a chemical, they give you a spec sheet telling them the spec sheet is the characterization. So they actually analyze it and tell you what the purity is. Fisher Scientific is another chemical um, manufacturer. So here we have technical grade. And we go down, um, these are the specs. And then we usually get a spec sheet, but the spec sheet comes usually, typically from a lot analysis, so they're not showing it here. Because depending on the lot, they'll analyze that it will characterize it to see what the purity is. And so the typical for technical grade, you're looking at 97%, 98%. It depends on the chemical. And so it's still pretty good. And it will vary depending on the synthesis. Here, um, for this, they're saying technical grade is considered a good quality chemical grade for educational purposes and has a purity of around 85 to 90 percent. But it is not pure enough for food and drug applications. Um, for ours, you know, our potassium dichromate's been analyzed, i.e., characterized, and so they determine the purity of it. And we'll have a sheet. I'll see if I can find the sheet so we can get that information. Okay, let's go back to the paper. Yeah. Okay, identify the materials you use and give the information on the degree and criteria for purity. But do not reference standard laboratory reagents. Give the chemical names. Okay, do not. Standard laboratory reagents would be like ethanol that you use to, to wash it and this kind of stuff. Give the chemical names of all compounds and the chemical formulas of compounds that are new or uncommon. So we'll need the formula if the compound's not common or if the compound's new. Otherwise, the name should suffice. That's what I did in the abstract. Describe your apparatus only if it is not standard and not commercially available. So our apparatus here could be, for example, the um, vacuum filtration apparatus. Although well, that's pretty standard. It's not commercially available because that was home built. And so um, this one, at least the tubes, you know, and how we connected the tubes. So we may or may not give it, but in, in our case, we can give it. It's fine. Giving a company name and model number in parentheses is adequate and non-distracting. So if it's a commercial, let's say the Acme vacuum filtration apparatus, then we'll just use that. Avoid using trademarks and brand names of equipment and reagents. Use generic names, including the trademark in parentheses after the generic name only. Um, th for chemicals, we often use the manufacturer of the chemical. 
And so here it says, um, do not give brand names. Brand names would be like uh, their brand name, but the manufacturer is different from the brand name. And so we often include the manufacturer of the chemical and the, and the grade. Describe the procedures you used unless they are established in standard. So here you're going to describe how you did it, not how the procedure says to do it. And so this has to be a description of what you actually did, not what you were supposed to do. If it's something standard, you don't have, really have to describe it. So for example, you, you don't have to describe that you walked to the balance room and then opened the balance door or whatever, like in Chem 1A. Note and emphasize any hazards such as explosive tendencies and toxicity. In a separate paragraph introduced by the word caution, include precautionary handling procedures and any other safety considerations. So we would include some stuff on this. The vigorous reaction between dichromate and oxalic acid. Some ACS journals and books will also indicate the hazard as a footnote on their contents pages. In theoretical reports, this section would be called theoretical basis instead of experimental details. We're not doing a theoretical report. All right, so the next section we are going to write is the experimental section. This is going to tell us. And so the experimental section is all in past tense. And so here um, we started with um, how many grams? So we could say um, we could even do this after or before, you know, depending on the style you want to do it. I usually write it in here. So let's say I weighed out 3.59 grams of um, potassium dichromate. And then um, what I did was I slowly added it a suspension of 10.32 grams of oxalic acid. Here, um, we could add a caution if we want, you know, uh, the vigorous, potentially vigorous reaction. The place generating C and CO2 gas. Then what? Then uh, we waited for the reaction to subside. So after the reaction subsided and the mixture cooled close to room temperature, What did you do? Those are four grams. 
four, I'm going to say I weighed out 4.32 grams of potassium oxalate. Now, here's where we can add in. So, for example, the uh, potassium dichromate, what I can do is I'm going to put this in parentheses and say the manufacturer. Let's say this manufacturer was Sigma Aldridge, and let's say it was technical grade. So I'm going to put that in here. Now, you don't, you don't know because did you take a picture of the label on the bottle? No. So that's normally data we take down in our observations. You know, we take a look at the bottle and then we look who the manufacturer is and what the grade of the chemical is. Even then, we have to be careful with purity. There's a very famous story about this. You know, if you buy a brand new bottle of this stuff and you open it fresh, then you can kind of be sure that what they have is what they say they have. So, for example, if you buy a brand new bottle, it usually comes with an analysis sheet. The, um, the analysis sheet will tell you the uh, purity and what they found. So, for example, let's say I am looking at a sorbic acid. And so I buy a bottle of sorbic acid, and then I get a sheet. The sheet tells me, oh, the sorbic acid is 97% pure. And then it lists the major impurities that they found. So it lists, okay, how much lead did they find in the sorbic acid? How much chromium did they find? And so they have certain elements that they analyze for because the sorbic acid I bought was food grade sorbic acid. So they want to know how much heavy metals in there kind of thing. And the certain limits set by the, the FDA, you know, if you're using food grade chemical, you can't have more than this amount of lead, you know, th this kind of stuff. Um, but... That's a brand new bottle. What if the bottle's been sitting on the shelf and a lot of students have been using it? And a lot of students, you know, maybe they're in a rush. And uh, they're in a rush and maybe they don't clean things as much as they should. And maybe it got heavily contaminated. Yeah. Or what if it, it started to decompose? You know? So there's a very famous story of uh, MIT. There's a laboratory at MIT called Lincoln Laboratory. And they spent years researching, this is a physics group, uh, researching this um, metal oxide for an, its interesting electronic properties. And so they took all kinds of measurements, but they had to synthesize it first. What they didn't realize is that the starting material that they were using was not what they thought. Um, and so all this time they had thought they were using this, but it turned out to be something else entirely. And so after that story, what most people do is before they even mix the chemicals, they analyze the reagents because they just don't trust. So if you're gonna invest a lot of time, you know, usually you don't trust it. Usually you run some quick tests to make sure that what they say you bought is what you actually bought. And so if I'm buying potassium dichromate, I might run a quick test to just analyze the identity and purity of that. And that's called characterization. If you look at a lot of synthesis labs, like when I look at my title, I, I see synthesis of potassium trioxychromate. But if we go to Google Scholar, And we do a search. Um, it's usually synthesis. Do you see what comes up first on my search bar? When I type in synthesis, do I get synthesis first? No, I get synthesis and and what characterization is. It's very important. Characterization is proof. You know, proof that you want to characterize it because you want to prove to the reader that what you claim to have synthesized is actually what you have synthesized. And you want some purity data. So, for example, somebody will ask you, well, how pure are your crystals of potassium trioxalate chromate? Three, did you characterize it? Did you characterize 
size or did you determine the purity? Did we? Not yet. Maybe we will. Maybe we won't. Maybe we're just going to leave it at synthesis. And so characterization is very important, synthesis and characterization. So when we look at this, like these people synthesize some mesostructured materials, well, they synthesize and characterize the material. Let's see some other articles. Polyactite um, synthesis and characterization. Here's one. Tetrachus. Tetrachus, you know what that's for? Bistris. Tetrachus. Tetrachus is for four ligands. And so this is four of these two six diphenyl ligands. And so this is kind of up our this they're um, synthesizing. So let's read their abstract. Tetrachus two six diphenyl digermine. 1B has been synthesized in its molecular structure determined. So they didn't really tell us. The focus of this is they're more interested in the structural details, it looks like, than the synthesis itself, whereas we're more interested in the synthesis itself. So you can read some of these abstracts. That was a short and simple abstract. Let's look at this one here. Synthesis of the digermanium. There are, there are lots. This is a graphical abstract. This is not normally done, but this is just because they're interested in the crystal structure of this. So this is actually from the X-ray data. And they have this germanium germanium bond, which is the whole focus of this paper. And so a lot of these aren't so interested in the synthesis itself. Let's see if we have some other ones. Oh, this might be interesting. Low temperature synthesis. So this goes into more details here, you know, where they talk about it. Terrestrial water, CO2, et cetera, et cetera. Synthetic material. So we want a synthesis and characterization paper that has no um, cost to it. And um, some of these have no. Nature is definitely not free. We'll take call that when it's free. Maybe this one. Research gave those free papers here. Sometimes synthesis is also called preparation. And so we'll look at the PDF version of this. Free account. Well, anyway, we'll we'll look at some more, but let's continue. We'll, we'll look at some more as we go along. But we'll, let's continue with this for right now. So this is probably sigma average technical grade. We got to check it. The oxalic acid. We can check manufacturing grade for this as well. After the reaction subsided and the mixture cooled close to room temperature, 4.32 grams of potassium oxalate was added to the, what color was that? To the black suspension. Heated for 10 minutes. 
Does that sound about right? Something like that. Did any changes occur on heating? Not really? Okay. After cooling, uh, after the reaction, so maybe I'll avoid the saying after, after, but this is a rough draft. We shouldn't worry. We shouldn't edit it mentally. Ethanol is at ninety five percent. I don't know the manufacturer of that. Probably Sigma Hundreds, but we'll just say ninety five percent was um, was added to the. Suspension. Actually, I probably need to add more sentences in here, but ethanol 95% was added after placing the um, reaction product in a nice bath. Cool. Or was it added before? We'll have to sort out the details of this. Black crystals. That form were um, isolated by vacuum filtration. Portions. Portions we call aliquots sometimes. Aliquots. Um, is it 10 milliliters did you use? The crystals were transferred to a beaker and dissolved in a minimum of water for recrystallization. So we need to talk about the recrystallization step then. And so we'll just continue this later. Let's say it's several right now. All 
All right, we're gonna um, be working on this paper. So what I'll do is, well, I guess we're out of time for today. But we'll um, we'll continue this next time. I'm, are we here on Wednesday? Yeah, we'll just continue this on Wednesday. All right, any questions on this? So we'll bring the rough draft kind of together for.